Hi everybody and welcome to the introduction to corporate governance which is one of the first year modules for the three year undergrad program that's offered by the Institute of Chartered Secretaries. We're now called the Governance Institute of Southern Africa to align with our international body and this is the, the first lecture in a series of 13 lectures. I'm going to go through two modules today or two presentations if you like um, where I'm going to discuss the nature of corporate governance and what it is and then I'm going to go through some basic concepts that we, we, we need to understand in, in corporate governance as we go through our discussions on um, the rest of the, the modules and, and the various syllabus. I'd also like to take this opportunity to welcome you to to um, this profession and to our institute and to Wits University. I have been a company secretary for the last 15 years. I've worked in listed companies of various different sizes. I've worked across um, some unlisted companies and various different industries. I've worked with lots of different types of directors and lots of different scenarios. I've seen all sorts of things go right and I've seen all sorts of things go wrong and I'm hoping that I can share some of that wisdom with you. I am very sad to not be standing in front of you and um, I've, it's always been the most enjoyable part of, of lecturing has been just to engage with my students on a personal level. So to give you a little bit of a backstory, um, these lectures were obviously always held live at, at Wits University in the campus and I would get to engage with, with you, with, with my students on, an, on a one-to-one -one basis. And then earlier in the year when COVID broke out, we had to go into a remote environment and these lectures were then recorded um, and put onto a YouTube portal, which, you, which is where you will have found this one um, through the Sakai system. And, and that worked very well, but uh, what I've done now is I've changed up it the, the presentation slightly so you can actually see my face and you can see me talking to you and um, I'm hoping that that makes a little bit more personal. The downside is that I'm now doing the recording myself so the quality isn't as good as it is in, in some of the other presentations that you might find on that YouTube portal the, the reason being that I had a professional assist me with those so there's some pros and cons you, you get maybe a little bit more of a personal interaction with me and, and, and you can see the expression on my face and I, I I get very excited about this topic um, and hopefully going forward we can we can meet in person at some stage and, and have a personal engagement. Um, on the nature of corporate governance in particular, the role of a company secretary has traditionally encompassed this corporate governance um, aspect to it. We went originally started off being very compliance driven, making sure that the company's act was met and we actually had a background in accounting. Um, thank God those times have changed because I think if I still had to kind of be an accountant as well as a company secretary, it would be an entirely different person talking to you today. Um, I managed to scrape through my board exams um, for financial management with the mandatory 50% and I'm not, not, not in shame to tell you that at all. Um, nowadays it, it has not only become uh, substantially based in law but it's become substantially based in strategy and taking governance and what it means to be a good corporate citizen as a company and what does it mean to be ethical and really integrate that into your strategy for the good of your entire company, not simply because it's what's expected or it's the it's the hip thing to do at the moment, it's the buzzword or whatever. It actually brings monetary value to your business. So I'm going to start my formal presentation now and um, and hopefully by the end of this presentation and the next one that makes up part of this class, you'll have a, a nice solid understanding of, of where corporate governance fits into the world. Let's start with the very basics. So you have a bunch of people and they want money. Like we all want money. I mean, come on, we all want money. So they've got a bit of money and they want to turn it into more money. And going and buying lottery tickets is not necessarily 
you know, the risk is a bit high that they're actually just going to spend a thousand rand on lottery tickets and they're not going to win anything. So they really want some type of guaranteed or at least a, a relatively good chance that they're going to get a return on their investment. So what they do is they take their money and they invest it into a company. And at this point, we can call them investors or we can call them shareholders. It's a, it's a similar concept. Later on in the course, we'll go into a little bit of detail as to when one refers to a shareholder and when one refers to an investor. And it's really around intention. But they take their money and they put it into a company or some form of a business entity. But in this regard, we're in this in this concept, we're going to talk about a company. And they, with the hope that this company is going to earn more money um, and that they're going to grow their earnings and pay out dividends and the value of their money is going to increase since it's been invested in this company. If we look at a company and we think of and, and shareholders and how how it works is if you think of a pie, uh, there's a set size that pie can only be a certain size. So shareholders come in and they um, they buy up certain pieces of the pie and in my example here I've got shareholder one he's got 50% of the pie and my other two shareholders have each got 25% of the pie that slice of the pie is represented by a share certificate which is issued by the company secretary as proof that they own that slice of the pie their expectation is that that pie is going to generate returns for them and make more money in the long run as i said that's that's the objective of all of us really at the end of the day is is is, is to get money out of this business let's have a look at the nature of a company the entity into which these shareholders have put their money a company is like a person it exists, it has rights, it has obligations, it can own things, it can owe debts to people, so it can have liabilities, it can enter into contracts, it can behave in the same way as a person would. However, it doesn't have a body, it doesn't have a mind, it can't make decisions, it can't actually act on anything. It needs someone to do those things for it. So it has the right to do things, but it needs someone to do it. And the best way of thinking about this is, is like a baby. So this is a baby. It's a human being. It has rights. Um, it has a right to a life. Um, it, it has a right to own things. It has a right to grow. It has a right to go to school and be cared for and nurtured. But it can't do those things for itself. It's dependent on someone to do those things on its behalf. So the owners of the company would be the shareholders. They own all the slices of the pie that we, we saw earlier, and they're a little bit like the parents of this baby, the company. But they go to work like we all do, and they need someone to take care of this baby, this company. They may not be adequately um, uh, skilled to take care of it. Um, it may be that they, they themselves have other interests and they're really just looking for that return on that investment. Sometimes a shareholder will also be a director. But nevertheless, you have these shareholders, these parents, and they then appoint someone to take care of this company. And in our analogy of a baby, you can think of this as being like the nanny or the daycare um, or the school teacher who has these skills to, to give this company its rights and let it live this full, happy life. The directors as managers are accountable to the shareholders for how they look after the company. So very much like when you go and you drop your kids at school and you say, bye, PD, have a nice day at school. You trust that that teacher is gonna take care of your kids and you hold those teachers accountable for how they take care of your kids when you drop them off. So that relationship between the director and the shareholder in respect of the company is very similar. Equally though, 
the directors have a responsibility to the company to ensure that they act in its best interests and that they make sure that this company is going to have um, it's going to be around for a long time that its assets are going to be secure that it pays its debts on time so very much like the teacher is responsible to the student to give them good quality education to make sure that they do their homework to make sure that they understood the work that they were doing that's very much the role that directors have I just want to hover for a second on two words on the slide one is accountability the directors are accountable to the shareholders and they are responsible to the company The shareholders and the directors are two parties that have some sort of interest in the company and how it does and what it does on a day to day basis and how successful it is. But there are lots of other entities and people and groups of people and groups of entities that are also affected by this company and are also interested in how this company does and how it manages its operations and how it conducts itself in society employees depend on the company for jobs so when they sign up with this company for a job and their employment contract says that they'll get paid on the 25th of the month then they have an expectation that they will be paid on the 25th of the month they have an expectation that while they're working for the company they will be able to improve their skills um, and contribute to the growth of this company and have their own personal satisfaction funders who lend money to the company such as banks they charge interest to the company and they expect that that um, those repayments are going to be made and they're going to earn that interest and that company is going to keep on meeting its financial obligations customers expect that they when they buy services or products from this company that those services and products are going to be of a good quality the quality that was promised to them and delivered in a manner that they could reasonably expect the community in which the company operates expects that the company is going to be a responsible corporate citizen in terms of not polluting the air or not pumping dirty rubbish into the water um, and there's lots and lots of examples of of the this dynamic between communities and companies communities also depend on companies to provide jobs for members of those communities and um, to to all round be a member of that community itself suppliers have contracts with the company they like like uh, employees they expect to be remunerated or paid in terms of those contracts that the company will honor its obligations to their suppliers regulators if the com company operates in a certain space like if it's a listed company the JSC will be its regulator if it operates in financial services then the financial services Services Conduct Authority will be its regulator and those regulators expect that the company will operate within the ambit of the regulations they will be compliant they will uh, maintain their license obligations they will pay their license fees and they will also contribute to that industry that's regulated and when you look at everyone that's involved with this company anyone who has some sort of an interest in how this company is conducting its business we collectively refer refer to all of those as stakeholders stakeholders include shareholders and directors as well now these big group of people all have various aspects of their own personal interest in how this company performs this group can be very very big so on my initial my, my previous slide um, we just looked at a, at, at a group of um, obvious people that might be involved with the company but let's just look at shareholders there for a moment so if you're employed at a company that has a pension or a provident fund part of your salary is deducted every month and it's put into a pension fund and it's sent off to Alexander Forbes or to Liberty or Stanlib or Momentum or one of these entities and they put it all together with other people's money and then they go and invest that into 
various areas, but including the stock market. So they will go and invest into companies with the intention of earning more money on your behalf for your pension fund. So when you look at how big a stakeholder group can be, it's not just that one little shareholder anymore who's just put his thousand rand into a company. It's an enormous group of people. It's everyone who, who invests in a pension fund will find their way into a company some way. They may not know it. So if you have contributed to a provident fund or a pension fund in the last 15 years, I guarantee you, you were impacted by what happened at Steinhoff. You didn't know that because you didn't even know that you were a shareholder indirectly through various avenues, that you were a shareholder in Steinhoff. The impact on you may be very small because because you had invested a relatively small amount through your various provident fund, but there will be a loss to you in terms of the return on your investment. So you, as an individual listening to this presentation, you have an interest in how companies are governed. Ultimately, you form part of that, st that broader stakeholder group. When we look at these very, very big shareholders, uh, particularly that invest pension fund monies, um, we refer to those as investors. So that's the slight differentiation between the, the reference to shareholders and the reference to investors. Investors is a much bigger corporate group and they're normally institutionalized and you probably know their names very well. Shareholders, we tend to refer to as being individuals. Again, in your exam, if you use the terms um, together or separately, I, I'm not going to lose not going to lose any marks on it. Um, it's just to give you a broader perspective of how big this stakeholder group actually is. Let's have a look at the individual interests of each of these groups of people. So shareholders, they're there for dividends. They're there for money, as we said right in the beginning. They want their money to grow. They're investing it. Just like when you put your money into a pension fund, you are hoping that one day when you retire that you, that money will have grown from what you, if you had put it in a shoebox under your bed, it would have not grown, but if you put it into a provident fund and it was invested in companies, it will have grown. Directors, they're there for the money. In the same way that teachers are there for the money, they love their jobs, they're very good at their jobs, they spent a lot of time training and specializing and they get a great de degree of personal satisfaction out of it doing it, but it is their job and they are there for money. Directors particularly, their remuneration structures are, are based around a fixed component, so they get a paycheck every month and then they also get incentive bonuses around how well the company has done against certain measurements that that might be agreed beforehand with the board so they're there for bucks stakeholders they are looking for employees are looking for job security customers are looking for um, honest products and services suppliers are looking for their contracts to be um, upheld regulators are looking for lawful behavior so every single one of these stakeholders all has a slightly different interest in why they are involved in the company and how this company performs those interests don't always align. If you had to go and ask a shareholder, I've got, if you're a company and you say to the shareholder, I've got a million bucks, what shall I do with my million bucks? There's a million rand in profit that's left over. What shall I do with it? The shareholder will say, pay me a dividend, pay it now, pay me a dividend, I want the money. If you ask the directors, they will say, you know what, hey, we worked long hours to earn that extra for that company to get that extra million. We want some of it as, as an incentive. If you had to go to stakeholders, um, employees would expect that their salaries would be increased or that their incentive schemes would be increased or that more money would be spent on training. Community members might expect that that money is used to improve the community and maybe um, implement some community-based projects. Um, 
and customers would expect that they that maybe their products would become cheaper suppliers would expect to get a better margin on their um, arrangements with the company so everyone has a different wish for this uh, demand on this company and its profits what they all want though at the end of the day is for this company to continue to remain in business that's the one thing they have in common no one wants this company to go out of business because then the shareholders are going to lose their money the directors are going to lose their jobs and their paychecks the customers and are going to lose their supply chain the employees are going to lose their jobs everybody wants this company to be sustainable which means that it keeps on going successfully in the long term how do you secure sustainability that's going to be what we talk about for the next 12 lessons or so but there's various uh, levels and um, methods that are incorporated into commercial arrangements in order to support the sustainability of a company the first is legislation so legislation is right at the very top you have to comply with this this is law and in terms of a company it will start with the companies act but it'll include income tax act the vat act uh, employment equity act uh, be act uh, competition act any sort of commercial law minimum requirement gotta comply with the law then regulation this is what is also referred to as subordinate legislation so um, it sits underneath regulation and it generally gives a lot more guidance to a specific piece of legislation so if you're in the financial services sector um, you will have regulations around how you um, make certain investments um, how you have banking licenses everybody has somehow come up against the national credit act um, and there's lots of regulations that sit underneath that in terms of how you assess people's credit viability fika um, also has regulations the regulation that we deal with quite often and we reference a lot in in a practice of a company secretary is the jse listings requirements so um, any listed company will need to comply with those listings requirements and that is a subordinate regulation that comes from the financial uh, markets act then ethics now this might just seem like a very easy thing like really you just you just be a good person that at the end of the day you just be a good person but there's a lot of debate and a lot of discussion when you start trying to think about what does it mean to be a good person and in the company if you think of a company as a person what does it mean for the company to be a good person COVID has given us lots of examples of um, where companies have actively decided to be good corporate citizens and what ethics meant to them and in that regard I, I, I direct you to Vodacom and go and have a look at the number the sheer number of projects that they have implemented purely to support South African citizens over COVID and if you have a look at their latest trading information it's cost them a hell of a lot of money and they've done it because they believe that good ethics are going to underpin and secure the sustainability of Vodacom over a long period of time so there's a business reason to be ethical there is no decision that you can make that is unethical that will be in the best interest of the company you can never say let me defraud the company it'll be okay for the short term and um, you know it'll it'll prop up sustainability there is never an unethical question that that or an unethical action that will support support a bigger part of the sustainability of the company then there are codes and these depend very much on the sectors that the company is operating in and the code that we deal with the most that impacts every single entity including companies will be your king codes which um, I will go through in the second part of this presentation and this is the king codes on good corporate governance with lots of recommendations as to how you go about achieving good corporate governance and then the company's own policies themselves now 
A company makes a policy. That policy, once approved, if it's done properly uh, through the board and approved properly by the board, becomes law to the company. It may as well move all the way up to being legislation. The company must adhere to its own policies. The only difference is that the company made that law itself, so if it wants to change it, it doesn't have to go to Parliament, it just has to go back to the board. And, and that's perfectly acceptable if you discover that your policy doesn't suit your company's needs, then that's absolutely fine. But to the extent that a company's policy is in play in the company, then the company must follow that policy and the policy must also be directed towards the sustainability of the company. So all of these five little purple arrows on the left hand side of your screen, those are all mechanisms that support the sustainability of the company and they will be the subject of the next four years of your study of this subject if you go all the way through to board exams. Collectively, we refer to this this universe as being corporate governance as a whole. And when we look at corporate governance, we look at the whole aspect of shareholders, stakeholders, directors, companies, sustainability, supported by these five areas um, of, of, of governance and how they play into ensuring that the company remains sustainable and everybody involved in the company has confidence that this company will remain sustainable. There's various ways in which that corporate governance framework, that, that framework of those five arrows on my previous slide, find their way into a company. Firstly, through direction, being the strategy of the company. The strategy of the company is, what are we going to do to achieve our objectives? What are our objectives and how are we going to achieve them? Those objectives, once we've agreed them, then need to be put into place, which is what the directors do in terms of management. And they make sure that in the company, everybody then implements the strategy. The board also then supervises that implementation by management. So if you have responsibilities going down from the board to management, then you have reporting going up. This is a very important concept to remember. And I'm going to move slightly so you can see my hands. Okay, so if you have delegation down of responsibility from the board down to management, then you have an obligation that goes straight back up again to report how you discharged your responsibilities. It's a very important concept to understand. If you delegate something down, there must be reporting back up. And the same thing works in terms of the relationship between the directors and the shareholders. So remember, I used the word accountability. So those directors have to be accountable to the shareholders at the top. How do they discharge that accountability? By reporting. So the shareholders make the, the directors responsible for managing the company. The directors remain accountable to the shareholders for how they manage the company. And in, in, in disclosing that, they have to report. That's how the delegations work. If you delegate down, you report back up. And if you can remember that visual concept in your mind, which is why I'm going to all the pains of showing you my hands because this comes up in exams and it it's a concept that will come up throughout your entire career if someone gives you a responsibility you have a concomitant duty to report to them on how you did it and that is the basis of board reporting um, all of our packs and all of our information that management sends to the board and then that becomes the basis of all of our reporting to our shareholders our annual financial statements and our integrated report and all the announcements that we make in the public domain about how the company is doing and performing, um, how the directors have been appointed, which directors have been appointed, whether they've been trading in, in the shares. That is all part of that responsibility to report back on obligations that were delegated to you. Ultimately, those four arrows 
are the conduit through which corporate governance finds its way into the company, ultimately with this, this ultimate goal of supporting sustainability. So on that note, I'm now going to move to the second part of this presentation. So there will be a new video and a new set of slides and it all forms part of class one.